Hi, Mr. Martinez, can you put her picture? Um, we see the other see slide. The yeah. Oh. yeah. Hi. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon now, yes. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Okay. Hey. Hi there. Hey, welcome to Destination Space 2021. My name is Andres Martinez. I'm a NASA engineer. I'm supporting the Exploration Systems Division. But my office is not too far from your schools at NASA Ames Research Center. Today, today we have a very special guest. Remember, during these talks, during these presentations, there's only one rule, and that is we all keep our mics closed, okay? We all need to be very, very quiet so that our special guest can, can um, share with us all of her incredible work. So today we have an astronaut. She was a NASA astronaut. Her name is Barbara Morgan. And guess what? She was also a teacher, just like Ms. Martinez and Mr. Natividad. We were truly blessed to have uh, an opportunity to have a special guest with us. Barbara Morgan, she was an educator and she is a retired NASA astronaut. Ms. Morgan is the public elementary school teacher who trained with us to go to space. And she also spent 10 years with NASA as an astronaut. She is now a distinguished educator in residence emeritus at Boise State University. I'm very delighted to have my friend, Barbara Morgan, whom I met almost 10 years ago at MIT with us today. Uh, so let's all now welcome Ms. Barbara Morgan. Well, thank you, Andres. <laughs> oh, we are so happy that you're joining us today. So, Mr. Natividad, let's get started. Okay. Sorry. How are we doing? Yeah. Well, shall I just jump in? First of all, yeah. uh, boys and girls, students, young men, young women, and your teachers and your administrators, thank you so much for allowing me to meet with you today. Uh, this is really fun for me. I'm so proud of you all for the hard work that you're doing when you're in physical school and when you have to be at home doing school too. And um, we're just, we just want you to know we're really, really proud of you. And I understand you've been learning a lot about NASA with this wonderful program with my friend Andres Martinez. And um, I think you learned all about present about our Mar wonderful Mars rover, uh, Perseverance, this uh, past month. And I understand now you've been learning all about our new program for uh, sending humans back to the moon and onto Mars, so the Artemis program. And I'm so excited that just a couple days ago, you got to talk to another uh, really good friend of mine who I work very closely with, Mr. Kirasic. And uh, we, we work together in Mish Control. One of the astronaut jobs is to serve as Capcom. And that's the communicator in Mish Control that sends all the messages from Mission Control up to our crews on orbit. And then we relay them back down to Mission Control. And Mark Kirasich was uh, one of our flight directors. He's kind of like, he would be like um, Ms. Martinez. He would be like the principal or the superintendent. Wow. Awesome. So uh, we'll get to start with some of our questions. And these are a lot of the questions that our students asked us. You know, they wanted to talk to a real astronaut and ask them. But can you tell us about your background, maybe, you know, where you grew up, you know, what school was like for you? You bet. Well, I grew up not too far from you all. I grew up in Fresno, California. And uh, my grandparents actually lived in San Jose. And so I used to go up and uh, uh, spend uh, time with them. They had a little apartment uh, in San Jose. And so I would get on the bus from Fresno, California and take the long bus ride up to San Jose. And um, so that's kind of my background. I went to college to study 
biology, human biology, and I really loved it. I loved science and I loved math. I also loved reading and I loved art and all the other subjects too, but I was particularly interested in, in science and math. And so I went to college to do science. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And, uh, and I want all of you to know that it's okay if you don't know quite what it is when you want to grow up, but learn all about all these different opportunities. Learn about, when I was a kid, I didn't know I could be an engineer. When I was a kid, girls didn't do that. And, um, and now for both you boys and you girls, anything that you set your mind to doing, you, you can do it and, there, and you don't have to have anybody to stop you. You can do it, just gotta work hard at it. And, um, and you'll be able to do whatever it is you wanna do, including being an astronaut if that's what you wanna do. So um, when I was little, I did wanna be a teacher, but when I got to high school, I wasn't going to be a teacher. I told you when I was growing up, that's, girls couldn't be scientists and engineers. I didn't even know anything about that. I just knew I really liked the sciences. And uh, I knew that as a girl, I could be a teacher or a nurse or a secretary or a mom and a wife. But, uh, and I really fought that Bought it at the time. It was because it was so limiting and I wanted to do other things too. So again, I'll tell you, I'm so excited that you're living in this day and age where it's not the expectation that you're going to be this or this. The expectation is you can be whatever it is you want to be and do when you grow up. So uh, the reason I got into being a teacher was I looked while I was in college and I was studying human biology, I started looking at what classes I was most excited about. I loved all my classes, but in particular, I took this class that just fascinated me. And it was all about the structure and the function of our brains. How do our brains work and what do they look like? And really getting into the biology and the chemistry of it. Mm -hmm. And then I took another class that was a psychology class that was all about memory, short and long-term memory. And at the same time during my summers, I was working as a counselor at a kid's camp and I loved being around the kids. It was just, we just had so much fun. And one day I was in the, in the university bookstore and this was really close to San Jose. I was in the Bay Area going to college and um, I walked over to the education section of the bookstore. Don't ask me why, because I was not gonna be a teacher. But there was this book that really caught my attention and it had this picture of a beautiful woman on the front and I picked it up and I started reading it and I was hooked on this book. It was fascinating. And it was all about a woman that I had never heard of before. And her name was Maria Montessori. Now you teachers and Ms. Martinez and uh, Mr. Not not even not to divide sorry i'm butchering the name but uh they're very very familiar with you guys are very very familiar with maria montessori well i had never heard of her before but i loved her thoughts about how people learn and especially how kids learn and so i kind of thought you know what given these classes that i love and this book that i love and being around kids that i love and working with them at at, at summer camps why am I fighting this? It seems like I should be a teacher because those are the things that really interest me. And I became a teacher and I was going to do it for about 10 years and then go back to school and become a, a, a scientist doing research in a laboratory. But you know what? I loved it so much that I kept doing it. So I was a school teacher for 24 years in public school. I ended up not being in a private school like Montessori. I was in a public school because I wanted to, um, I just wanted to be in a public school and be able to work with all kids. So that was my career. Wow. Can I ask you what grades did you teach? So I taught mainly second, third and fourth grade, little guys. Oh, yes. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Um, getting to that, because this was the big question, um, what was it like, you know, um, in terms of your process of becoming an astronaut? Yeah, like how did that happen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and for you kids out there, for you boys and girls, I, I hope you'll really learn from this too. You never know what opportunities, oops, sorry about this. 
you never know what opportunities are going to come your way. And as long as you keep your doors open, if, you, if you're prepared and you don't, you're going to have people in your life. And I don't know why we people do this to each other, but it happens to everybody. And I know your teachers will tell you it happened to them too. But at some point, people are going to say, oh, you can't do that. You're not smart enough. Or you can't do that. You're blah, blah, blah. You know, and I don't know why we do that to people and we shouldn't because you can do whatever it is you want to do. If there's something you think you can't do, it's just all it means is that you haven't learned how to yet. And it's something that you can learn how to do. And so if you keep that attitude of I'm going to keep learning because I love learning. It's so interesting. These opportunities are going to start coming your way that maybe you hadn't even thought of. I told you when I was growing up so I had already graduated from high school when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon. There were no women that I saw in that program. So again, it was just, you know, nothing that I ever even considered would be something I could do. But I loved it and I loved watching. I watched all of the uh, uh, all of NASA's programs when I was growing up. I loved I loved the idea of exploration. I loved looking up at the stars and thinking about our universe and our place in it and what it's like. And so um, years, years later, I had been teaching for quite a few years. Um, as teachers, we are always trying to get smarter, learn more, and to make, our, to make your learning a lot more fun and a lot more relevant. So we, take, we go back to school, we take lots of classes, we do experiential learning where we actually go, you know, maybe it's not in a classroom, but it's out doing things. We're always looking for those kinds of opportunities to, to um, make our classrooms more exciting for all of you. And so uh, one day I, after school, I went home like I always did. And one of the first things my husband and I did was we turned on the evening news and we were watching the evening news and, um, President Reagan came on the evening news. He was the president at the time. And he made this announcement that NASA was going to send a teacher into space. And I sat right up and I thought, wow, that's an opportunity. What a neat thing to learn about. And it's something I'd always been interested in, but of course, you know, like I told you, it wasn't something that I thought I, I would ever be a part of or could do. And so a whole bunch of us teachers from all around the country uh, applied to the program and uh, we learned so much. And I just happened to be very, very lucky and be able to be selected as backup teacher in space for our first and always and wonderful teacher, Krista McAuliffe. And uh, it, was, it was just such a great opportunity and that's how I got started. Unfortunately, it ended up with a really bad thing, with a, in a really, that just tragedy. We lost, uh, you've probably heard about the Challenger accident, but we lost our crew, our wonderful, wonderful crew that we had trained with. We lost our wonderful teacher, Krista. We lost our uh, space shuttle, although that was tragic, but nothing compared to actually losing the astronauts, the people on board. And um, at that time, NASA had asked if I would continue on and uh, step into Krista's shoes and fly as a teacher when they were ready to fly again. And I felt it was really important, especially for all you kids, that we that you see adults doing the right thing in a really bad situation. And to me, what's the right thing? Well, first of all, it's figuring out what we did wrong, figuring out what happened, what went wrong, what did we do wrong, and how can we fix it and keep the future open because there is so much to learn out there. And I know you're already excited about space, right? Because you've been participating in these wonderful programs with, uh, with uh, Ames Research Center and Andres Martinez and, and your, uh, your uh, administrators and teachers. So we wanted to keep that future open for you. So um, even though it was really sad and really hard uh, to lose all of our, our really close friends, we felt it was really important to continue this on. So I said, yes. And um, unbeknownst to me, I did not know that it would not be a teacher in space, but that, it, and it actually took many, many years. It was many years later that uh, NASA uh, finally said, hey, you know, we want you to come apply to the astronaut class of 1998 and, um, and um, 
come, come join the astronaut board. So ah, that's kind of how that happened. Thank ended. you. Um, so 1998, what was it like um, when you were entering to launch? What was it like? So I actually launched in 2007. So there were many years there of lots of training. Yeah, so you don't, so that's the other thing for you kids to know, you know, you don't just launch into space. You have to work really, really hard. There is so much to learn. So my classmates and I, we were called the penguin class. So every class gets a name and uh, we were the penguins. And uh, the, um, we were called the penguins because they are flightless birds. They don't fly, but uh, all of my classmates and I proved our, our rest of our astronaut colleagues um, wrong because we all flew, <laughs> so just like they did. But um, we had to learn all about the space shuttle systems and how to operate them. So these are really uh, very, and Andres can tell you more about this, but the engineering behind the space shuttle is incredible. Very complex, very technical. So we had to learn all of that. And I loved every bit of it. And, and in fact, one of the things I loved that I didn't expect to, I didn't think I'd be very interested in engines. The main engines of the space shuttle are absolutely fascinating. And the orbital maneuvering system, those are the other engines that we use to, to be able to, uh, to orient our, uh, and, and to, uh, you have to have them to fly the space shuttle. And then we have a whole bunch of little tiny jets around the space shuttle called the reaction control system. Those engines were all fascinating to me. And if you had asked me when I was a kid, would I be interested in engines? I probably would have said, eh, I don't think so. So again, going, going at all this learning with a big open mind really, really helps you. So we learned all about the space shuttle systems and how to operate them. That took uh, a couple of years. We learned all about the uh, International Space Station that was just starting out and all, all those systems that would, they weren't all in place yet. They would come later, but we had to learn about all that. And it took us two whole years of really, really intense training and lots of study. I did so much homework and spent hours and hours and hours learning this stuff. And then once we spent two years learning all of our basic training, then we actually got jobs so that we weren't just in the learning mode, we were also in the working mode when we, and that's when we moved into our advanced training. So I'll tell you both a little bit about my jobs and then also about our advanced training. So my jobs uh, during that time were to uh, work on uh, crew equipment for both, for our crews on both the space shuttle and on what would be the International Space Station. And another job of mine, I mentioned Mark Kurosich was being Capcom, so working in mission control, and they are a big part of your team. You're not just the team on orbit, we've got thousands of people who are your teammates that we work with. And then my other job was working on robotics. And I can tell you, I knew nothing about robotics when I got started. And it was fascinating to learn all the engineering and all the technical stuff behind it. And uh, then to be able to uh, be in orbit and, um, and fly the space shuttle and the space station robotic arms. Uh, to me, I told you earlier, I love math. It was like, it was math in action and it's really fun to do. So those were my technical assignments and then, or my jobs. And meanwhile, I was doing all my advanced training, which was things like spacewalking. Uh, so we call it the extravehicular activity or EVA spacewalking. It was all the robotics. It was things like um, learning how to rendezvous and dock. So how do you actually get, get one space, um, space uh, craft like a space shuttle to actually dock with part of the International Space Station. And then when I flew in 2007, uh, my crewmates and I, we were a construction crew. And if you'd asked me when I was a kid, would I ever be a construction worker? I liked doing construction, but I never thought I would be a construction worker. Well, that's exactly what my crewmates and I were on our space shuttle mission because we helped put together the International Space Station. We were, that was our job, was to help build it. That's awesome. You had so many jobs. And I'm wondering, you have done something that none of us have. And I'm wondering if, if we had, a, if I was a kid right now, closing my eyes, 
what did it feel like when you experienced, you know, microgravity? When did you know? Like, if, if we can invite everyone just to close their eyes and if you could just talk us what it felt like to experience being in space, that weightlessness. What's it like to be weightless? It is wonderful. So I'm going to uh, give you a couple examples that to me here on Earth are the kind of the closest for those that uh, aren't going into space or haven't been into space yet, or uh, maybe you haven't trained as an astronaut, because I'll, I'll tell you, we train for that too. Um, let me tell you that first. So for training to be weightless, just to experience that, uh, NASA has an aircraft. Uh, we've had a couple different ones. One was a KC-135 and one was a DC-9. And um, so to, like a regular aircraft, like you would use to fly from San Jose airport, maybe to uh, Los Angeles or to New York City, something like that. So um, it, that plane, we take out all the seats, except we leave just a few in the back of the plane, all right? But the rest of the, imagine that plane being hollow, no seats in it at all. View in the back, and then of course the, the uh, pilot and the co-pilot have their seats in front. The other difference is there's all kinds of padding inside the plane, thick padding about this thick. And there's a reason for that. So the pilots, we, we leave, uh, we're in, in Houston, Texas and at Ellington Airfield and we leave the airport and we fly out over the Gulf of Mexico. And once we get out over the Gulf of Mexico, the pilot starts taking the plane, flying it just like a roller coaster, up and down and up and down and up and down, all right? You know, you're thinking, wow. what? That's kind of crazy, right? So when we're going up, we're experiencing a couple Gs or two times Earth's gravity. So you, you kids that are 50 pounds, maybe, you're gonna feel like you weigh how much? Oh, cool. Like 100 pounds, right? So you'll feel pretty heavy. But what's interesting about, and the reason we fly up and down and up and down is because when we go over the top of that hump, we become weightless. It's called parabolic flight and you become weightless. And it's, and actually any of you that have ridden on a roller coaster have experienced weightlessness because when you went over the top of that roller coaster hill, you were weightless at the top. Now you may not have known it because you were only weightless for a split second. So maybe all you felt was your tummy maybe doing a little somersault or, <laughs> or maybe getting a little butterflies, but not enough to really get that experience of weightlessness, but you have been weightless if you've been on a, on a roller coaster. So for us, as the pilots are flying the plane up and down and up and down, when we go over the top, we get about 20 seconds worth of weightlessness. So we go from two Gs or feeling really twice as heavy as we are to being totally weightless for about 20 seconds and then two Gs again and then weightless again, et cetera. So that's, uh, that's how we practice being weightless uh, before we go into space. And it's also where we test out all of the equipment we're gonna be taking up or new ideas that we have that we think may help improve how we do work in space. We'll test those out on, the, uh, on that, on that uh, uh, parabolic aircraft. We also fly really interesting experiments on that aircraft. And there were some really interesting ones that NASA Ames was flying on several of the uh, mission, missions, those flights that I flew on. We can talk about that if you want. Okay. But for those of you that have not been on that airplane to know what it's like to be weightless or you haven't been in space, there are two things I can tell you that I, I hope will make sense to you. So the first thing is, how many of you, and maybe you just raise your hand or give a thumbs up, are pretty comfortable swimmers? You, you like to swim and you're pretty comfortable in a swim, swim, swim pool. Okay, so those of you that are, those of you that aren't, I want you to keep working at it, keep working at getting comfortable in the swimming pool. And those of you that are comfortable in the pool, have you ever floated in what we call a dead man's float where you're just totally relaxed and you're just hanging there? If you've been able to do that, that is very much what weightlessness feels like. So the next time this summer or the spring when you're able to swim, maybe try that. The only difference is when I'm hanging in a dead man's float in the pool, I definitely feel all that water around me. 
All right. And that's the difference. Of course, when you're weightless in space, you don't feel all this water around you. So you don't even really feel your arms. They're just kind of out there and you don't really feel them. Wow. Thank you so much. That's yeah. so amazing. Uh, okay. And for, I, I just want to share this because I think this sure. really will make sense to most of the uh, students and adults. But if any of you, so here's another question for you. How many of you in your dreams at night when you're dreaming, have ever dreamed that you were actually flying? You know, not stuck to the ground, but you were flying. All right. For those of you that have done that, that is exactly what it feels like to be weightless. Thank you. Wow. So you told us that you worked in the International Space Station. And so now we want to know how did it look? How did our Earth look from there? And what did you see? Yeah, so the view, one of the best things about being in space, you're very, very busy working, especially on our, you know, our, our space station crews now are there for six months to a year. They live there a long time. So we kind of stretch things out for them. It's kind of, we call it a marathon instead of a, a quick re race, right? So we do give our space station crews about a day and a half off where they can do whatever it is they want to do. So a lot of what they like to do is float over to the window and spend time looking out. For uh, a space shuttle cruise, when we were only, uh, we had so much work that we had to get done in two weeks, we had very little time to spend looking out the window. But we stole those moments when we could to look out. And uh, my favorite time when we were in orbit, when we weren't working, was uh, my crewmates and I decided to stay up late one night. So even though we were really tired the next day, we stayed up late so that we could all hang out and just spend time for one orbit. That's one hour and a half, 90 minutes. That's how long it takes us to go around the Earth in the space shuttle or the space station. Just looking at our beautiful planet and looking also out into our beautiful universe. And looking at our planet is amazing. Um, of course, most of the time you're over water. So one of my crewmates said, hey, why do we call this planet Earth? We ought to call it planet water <laughs> because so much of it is covered with water. Um, but looking at that water is gorgeous. And then when you do, when you are over the land masses, the, the blue, the, excuse me, not the blues, but the reds, for example, Australia, it looks like Mars. It is so red. It is really awesome to look at. But um, just looking at those different land masses um, and, and studying them, it, it's, like, it's like the best art you can ever imagine. In fact, one of the things we love to do with the word Earth, if you think about the spelling of the word Earth, what's right smack dab in the center? Eat. Art. 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 Oh my God. Our Earth looks like a gorgeous piece of art. It is amazing. And then when you take out your bigger camera lenses, like the 800 millimeter lens or the 400 millimeter lens, where you can look even get a closer view, it, it, they are just, they are like pieces of beautiful, beautiful art. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's wonderful. Awesome. Thank well, you. I know we have a lot of kids yeah. here with questions, and you've answered like pretty much everything <laughs> in one way or another. So, do you want to move to the student Q and A section right now? Yeah, sure, whatever you want to do. All right, and we can get uh, Miss Danielle to help us with Danielle, that too. Yeah. So, if students want to um, ask a question, feel free to either put it in the chat or raise your hand, and I'm going to put you, uh, Miss uh, Barbara, on as our spotlight speaker as we get that ready. Okay. Looks like we've got a lot of hands. Thank you so much, Ms. Morgan, for this amazing presentation. I, uh, whenever I get the opportunity to with the, the, not only the work they do, but when they get a chance to describe what it's like to be in space, it's, you know, it gives you chills. So what we're going to do, we're going to move into our Q&A section where we allow some of the kids unmute themselves. Let's go right. ahead and start out with Callie Pippin. If you want to go ahead and mute yourself, you can ask Morgan a question. Um, what is your favorite planet? My favorite planet, Callie, is our own planet, planet Earth. 
Now, I would love to visit the other planets. My, you know, my, uh, some of my colleagues that I work with, I'm retired from NASA now, but some of the younger astronauts who are still uh, working are working. They'll be going back to the moon. The moon isn't a planet, but it's a heavenly body. And I would love to go back to the moon. And then we are eventually getting ready to go to Mars. And I think it would be fascinating to actually be able to explore Mars with our own eyes and our own hands and our own feet and our own ears. But as far as what my favorite planet is, it's still planet Earth. Okay, let's go to Adrian Ortiz. If you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, you can ask Miss Morgan a question. Uh, what is it like to eat and drink uh, food? <laughs> Adrian, thank you for your great question. So I had a big surprise when I got into space. I, I, I knew to expect lots of things because we learn all about it. But one, th one of several things was a big surprise to me. First of all, I knew that when you are weightless, it takes a few days for your body to get used to it. And things shut down. So there's a... There's a technical term called peristalsis that maybe you have learned or haven't learned about that yet. But peristalsis is how your body moves food that you eat down through your body. It's part, it's the digestive system and it's what gets the food to move down. And when you get into space, peristalsis stops. Mm -hmm. Now that's really interesting. The other thing that happens is your body fluids, you know, all the fluid that's in your body, you don't have gravity pulling at it, so it shifts upwards. And in fact, if you saw pictures of me in space, my face would not look like it does now. It would look pretty round. And that's because of the fluid that shifts upwards. So when you first get into space, um, your brain thinks you have too much fluid in your body because all of that fluid has shifted up near your brain. So, and excuse my, my French or my language, but you actually get rid of uh, your number one a lot. So, um, so you've gotten rid of a lot of the liquid in your body, but you have to stay, you have to stay hydrated. I, because of the peristalsis shutdown, I really wasn't hungry the first couple of days, but I knew it was really important for me to stay hydrated, you know, to have lots of fluids. So I, for my dinners and my lunches would have, and my breakfast would have juice or soup. Well, the oddest thing happened. You, first of all, it, you, you're, you know, you can't just pour it in a bowl and eat it with a spoon, right? Without gravity, because you'd have soup everywhere, right? So we have these pouches and we have straws and the straws have a clip on them. And you put the straw in your mouth and you unclip it and then you can sip your soup or you can sip your, your um, orange juice or whatever. And then you have to be careful before you pull that straw out, you better clip it because if you don't clip it, you're gonna have juice and, and or, or soup but coming out, you know, and going everywhere. But the big surprise to me was I, it felt like, I don't know if you can see my, my, my suit here, but it felt like the soup got about this far or the juice got about this far and it stopped. So I was full from here to here rather than full in my tummy. And I thought, well, this is gonna be pretty odd. But uh, about two days, two or three days later, once my body got used to being in space and that peristalsis started working again and everything started working, then it was very normal. Um, your taste buds, because of that fluid shift, the taste buds that are in your tongue change shape. So that changes taste for a lot of us. So um, some, like, some people love drinking coffee on earth, but they don't like it in space because it doesn't taste as good. Mm -hmm. um, food can taste pretty bland if your taste buds change. So we like really spicy food. So some of my favorite food was actually uh, egg burritos with, uh, with very spicy salsa on, on the egg burritos. Uh, all right. Thank you. Okay, so we have time for one last question. And I actually have a really interesting one from Miss Moeller. She wants to know how long did it take your body to get back to normal after a trip to space? And do astronauts still have to quarantine? That's a great question. So we quarantine before we go to space, not after we get back. 
We, we quarantine, we're not bringing back anything dangerous with us, but we wanna make sure that we are not going into space sick because that would not be a good thing for us or our crewmates. So we quarantine for about two weeks before we go into space. Um, uh, how long does it take to get used to being back on earth in one gravity? So on our space shuttle missions, it didn't take too long. It took about three days for me to start feeling normal again. Um, it was very interesting. You know how when you ride a bike for a long time, or maybe you're skateboarding for a long time, when you get off your bike or off your skateboard, you kind of feel like you're still riding your bike or you feel like you're still skateboarding. For me, when I got back from space, I still felt like I could float. Like all I had to do was push up on my toes and I could go shoot to the ceiling. That's what it felt like. But darn, that gravity just kept me stuck to the floor. I couldn't really do it. But that I still had that feeling and that went away after about three days. Our crew members now who spend many more uh, weeks in space, so a lot more time, if you, you have to keep exercising or you lose muscle mass, you have to keep exercising or you lose calcium in your bones. Even, even on my two week mission, we, lo we lose calcium in our bones because we're not, we're not loading our bones. That's, a, that's an engineering term. We're not putting pressure on them because you're not walking on them and you don't have gravity that you're fighting against. So, um, uh, and that's not a good thing. You, you, need, you need calcium in your bones and you need muscle mass. And so our space station crew members, they exercise for two to three hours a day on board the International Space Station. And then when they come back down to earth, it takes them quite a few months to get back to being, back to their normal self. They have to work really, really hard at it. Well, okay. thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Morgan. This was an amazing experience for me. And I'm sure that it, it was the same for, for the little ones out there, their parents, their teachers, everyone that's watching this. Um, I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart. I know you have a very busy schedule, but um, I, I think this, this was just incredible. Uh, so- well, thank, you. thank you for this opportunity, Andres. And I, and I just like to leave by telling the, first of all, thanking all of you teachers and parents. Thanks for all you're doing for our future, those uh, young, young people in our classrooms and in our homes. Thank you so much. And for all you boys and girls out there, please, if you have, if, if anything, know that you can be just like Andres, you can be like Mr. Martinez, you can be just like Mr. Natalidad, you can be just like Ms. Martinez, you can be a teacher, you can be an engineer, you can be a scientist, we need you and you can be whatever it is you want to be when you grow up. And don't let anybody tell you you can't, you just have to be willing to work hard at it. Excellent, excellent, and that is the message that, that we uh, that we send every sing in, during every single one of these sessions. Can I invite everyone now to open up your video camera so that we can take a a, a screenshot with uh, this amazing uh, person, Miss Barbara Morgan, teacher uh, who went to space and um, and 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 a former astronaut, and now she's still um, uh, bringing lots and lots of value to many of us. Mr. Natividad, can we set it up so that we can now all um, our view that as a kaleidoscope and, and be able to take a, a, a photo? Go ahead. You can do it also, Mr. Natividad Martinez. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. It's ready. All uh, right. It's, it's not coming across. Oh, I'll take it. I'll take whoever, the picture. Whoever's speaking is, uh, is, is the main. The main. Okay. Everybody go. say cheese. One, two, three. I got it. Okay. And I know some of you still have your hands up, up and we will be answering more questions next, next Tuesday. Okay. Thank you. And remember, you, you can catch this recording on our YouTube channel. So um, our, our wonderful guest speaker had a lot of uh, questions that you guys asked again. You could also catch that recording there. All right. So, so once again, I, um, I wanna thank uh, Ms. Barbara Morgan. Thank you for joining us today. Um, amazing, amazing experience for all of us. Now, remember, remember the message that Ms. Morgan gave all of us, okay? You can be whatever you wanna be, an engineer, a doctor, a teacher. Remember we're doing this destination space 
series of um, incredible talks because you are very special to us. And because we need you to grow up, go to school, go to college, uh, be incredible members of our community and come help us. We need all, all of you to come and join NASA, okay? Or to join the Alam Rock Union School District as a teacher, all right? So thank you very much. Remember, um, next week we have other incredible people that are gonna be presenting to us. We're gonna learn about astronaut suits. We're gonna learn about habitats, structures that we're gonna be building on the moon. And then we're also gonna learn about the lunar gateway. All right, so we're gonna sign off. Thanks everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thanks.